Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Pastor Jeff Dibel of the Churches of Christ in Sydney, Australia, shares his journey to uncover the genuine Jesus from Scripture alone. After his brother Greg challenged him to understand Christ from a Jewish perspective, Jeff set out on a quest, reading through all of Scripture to see what it really said about the Messiah. What he found upended his life, bringing both delight at his clearer understanding of Christ and heartache over losing the church he planted and pastored for 19 years. This is his story. Here now is Podcast 366, Who Was Christ Before the Creeds, with Jeff Dibel. Well, Jeff Dibel, thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. Pleasure to be with you, Sean. I wonder if we could begin just with your childhood here and, and see if we can get a little background. But uh, did you grow up in a Christian home? Yeah, um, I was very blessed to be uh, able to grow up in a, a strong Christian home. My grandfather was a lay preacher, and so we would often follow him around to different uh, churches in the, the countryside of, uh, of southeast Queensland. And uh, my mother was very devoted as well. My father was killed in a car accident when I was only two years old, so I, I never met him or don't even have any recollection of him, uh, you know, apart from that situation. Yeah, it was a very strong and very positive heritage that we grew up in, my brother and I. Uh-huh. And are you the, the two only siblings, you and Greg? Yes, that's right, Sean, yeah. And who's older? Well, he's older. Oh, but, uh, Okay. But, uh, but we, we look so alike that people think we're twins. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you begin taking your faith seriously, or was it, were you always pretty passionate about it? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I was passionate about it right through, but then in my late teens, I, I had this crisis of faith. I mean, I knew what I'd always been taught I should believe, but I didn't really know whether I actually believed it or not. Uh, I had this crisis, and... and I decided that I would throw out everything that I w- couldn't be absolutely sure of. I was in university doing, you know, things that, and coming across other worldviews and different opinions, and it just caused me to question what I really believe. So I, I decided to do the Descartian thing of just throwing out everything that I couldn't be absolutely sure of, and I got to a place of absolute scepticism. I really believed that it wasn't possible to know anything for sure. But the interesting thing was, even though I was in this place of absolute scepticism, the one thing in all honesty I could not deny to myself was that there had to be some kind of creator. I just couldn't accept that the world and the complexity of the world that we have could have just happened without some intention or design behind it. So the first thing I realized that there had to be some kind of God or intelligence uh, in the universe. And then it was interesting, I I picked up the Bible one day and I started reading one of the Gospels. It was like I was reading it for the first time. I began reading about Jesus and he just came through with such authenticity uh, that to me was quite undeniable. And and it was like I, I began to believe afresh that he really was who he claimed to be. You know, I believe that there was a God. I believe that, and I said to myself, if there, if there is a God and if we can know him, he must have revealed himself in some way. And I, I became convinced that actually Jesus was the way that God has revealed himself to us. So that was the journey back into faith. And that was primarily from reading the Bible, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And how long did that period last where you were at a point of skepticism and then making your way back? It lasted maybe, wasn't that long, it was maybe 12 to 18 months, but it's, okay. you know, it seemed a darker period and longer period than that. Yeah. But uh, the interesting thing was that I was actually uh, doing both Bible college and university studies at the same time. And when I started to express some of, some of my doubts to my, my youth pastor back in my church, 
uh, he wrote to the Bible college and suggested that they kick me out because of my uh, unbelief. <laughs> uh, so what happened? Did you get kicked out? No, no, no. They, they didn't <laughs> kick me out. <laughs> Man. Yeah, with with a youth pastor like that, you don't need any enemies, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you were in That's Bible right. college and regular university at the same time. What were you studying in the university? So I was, I was studying behavioral sciences. Okay. And at Bible college, it was just a general Bible and theology? Yeah, that's right, yep. And that was at a Church of Christ school? Yes, that's right, yes. Uh, it was at, at uh, Churches of Christ. I've, I've grown up in Churches of Christ, and um, I've always uh, been able to kind of identify or appreciate that approach Um from, from that tradition. It's, I've always been able to really resonate with the DNA and the values and the approach that they took to the scriptures and to church life. Yeah, that's interesting. So you were, you were pretty aware of the differences between the Churches of Christ and, say, the Anglicans or some other Protestant denominations growing up? Yeah, I, I think I, not so much growing up, but you know, sort of as I got into Bible college and and then I was involved with other denominations in various organizational activities and yeah, just appreciated the differences in, in the different approaches. Yeah. And so after this, how did you end up getting started in ministry? Uh, well, my first appointment, I was actually uh, state director of youth and camping for Churches of Christ in uh, two states, Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, so I, I didn't go straight into a local church. I went into... Uh, youth ministry and and camping, and and did you enjoy that working with the youth? Yeah, I mean that was great, and uh, I love the I love the camps. Um, I mean, you just saw young people, you know, uh, in those situations, really come alive to God and and make some very significant choices and decisions and commitments. So yeah, that was great. Yeah, and so how long was that that you were uh, involved with camps? So that was for five years. Okay. And then what's next? And, and then I went into just local church ministry, actually with my brother, believe it or not. So uh, he was the pastor in a church that was growing quite significantly and he needed someone to help. And I ended up going there and, and we had two two brothers working in the same church. Hmm. And what was that like working with your brother, Greg? Yeah. I mean, we've always got on really well and... Yeah, that was great. Uh, it it went, went really well for a while, but then I realised after a little while that Greg was really quite burnt out and uh-huh. after a while decided he needed a break from the ministry and he went into ambulance work. So then I took over the leadership. Okay, so then what, what happened after that? We moved up to, to Sydney uh, to take on another ministry uh, in a church in Sydney and arrived the week before our third uh, and youngest son was born. Why did you end up moving there? I, I didn't really match the small town. Or it wasn't that small, but I mean the rural, you know, provincial centre. Uh, I didn't really match that situation so well. And uh, this was, I guess, a call back to, you know, suburban, large city ministry. And, and uh, I just sensed God was in that. And I did go into a church that I felt, you know, kind of matched or suited me uh, better. I see. Is that the same as the church that you eventually uh, became the leader of called Rivergum? Or is that, is that a different church? Yeah. So what happened was um, it was uh, Castle Hill was a suburb of Sydney where the church was. And uh, so that, that grew significantly. Uh, we planted one church and it's on the suburban fringe. So, you know, the city was growing out beyond us. We planted one church in a new developing area and we decided to plant a second church in another developing area. Uh-huh. And I thought I would just stay on uh, as lead pastor uh, at the church there at Castle Hill. But uh, I had a strong sense and that was backed up by, you know, a word of prophecy uh, to actually go and be the planting pastor or the pioneering pastor in the new situation uh, just further out. So I was actually at, at Castle Hill for about 12 or, or so years 
and then uh, moved on to plant the new church from that uh, original church. And how did it go at the new church? It's, uh, it's interesting when you start a new church with, you know, a couple of keen people, but uh, a blank page and and uh, lots of enthusiasm. It started well, but it did have some, you know, some seasons of up and down. There was no community facilities, so we launched in a big marquee. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm not... What is a marquee? It's a large tent. Oh, okay. And so then what happened next? The church uh, grew, and from me being the sole pastor, we brought on others, and, and we were meeting in the tent and then in the school. We, through quite amazing circumstances, were able to get uh, some land, and we put a large like a large shed, a, a temporary building on that uh, where we met, and the church continued to grow. That must have been so exciting to be part of. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a great time. Um, it's full on in terms of just uh, workload because I was also doing, you know, a few other things on the side. I got involved in uh, professional sports chaplaincy okay. with one of the major football clubs out here. That was really enjoyable. And then I have more recently gone into defence chaplaincy with the army. Uh-huh. And how long were you pastoring there? Yeah, so from the beginning uh, for nineteen years. Yeah. Wow, wow. So you really you you had spent over thirty years in Sydney. You know, first at the yes. what was it Castle? I, I can't remember. Castle Hill. Yeah, that's yeah. right. First at Castle Hill for twelve years, and then at Rivergum for nineteen. Uh, so mm. that's uh, that's a, that's a long time. Now, uh, let's just back up a second and and talk about what it was like when your brother suddenly lost his mind uh, and stopped <laughs> <laughs> stopped believing in the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity that everybody knows you have to believe in. Yeah, walk me through what was that like hearing him talk about that, and then of course his book came out. And what did you what did you make of all that? Yeah, well, I had always been Trinitarian. I I was taught that, I, I believed it, I preached it. Uh, and then one day, just out of the blue, my brother said, I need to let you know that um, I've been rethinking my theology and, you know, I no longer believe in the Trinity. Well, you know, I was totally gobsmacked. Is that a term you use? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we have something similar. Okay. It blew me away. Were you a stunned um, mullet? Yeah, that's it. That's a good word. Yeah, I was a stunned mullet. <laughs> that's, that's, Greg's, that's Greg's term for it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I, I was totally blindsided, you know, and when he started saying things like, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God but not God the Son, I remember the visceral reaction I had. I, I was literally feeling sick. Wow. Uh, and, and, and so, of course, my, my initial response was to obviously pull him out of whatever delusion he was under and, and uh, argue him back to the Orthodox faith. How did that go? Uh, well, not as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, as we started talking and discussing, and look, I need to say, if it was any, anyone other than my brother that had said this, I probably would have just dismissed it out of hand. But I knew that uh, that Greg had a love for the scriptures and believed in, you know, their authority and, and was was well studied. And, and and so, you know, if it was anyone other than my brother, I probably would have dismissed it. But I I knew that there would have been something behind, you know, his thinking. So we, we just got into theological discussions, talked about different passages, different verses, and I began to realise that, you know, this is not as clear cut as I thought it once was. And that, that sort of started me then on a, a journey of my own, you know, sort of uh, discovery and, 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 and re, re-looking at the whole thing. And yeah, were you, were you at liberty really to take that on at that time? Or were you so busy with other things? I was fairly busy. So I would, I would uh, do some thinking and reading on it. Then I'd sort of put it to the side, you know, and then I'd pick it up again a few weeks or a few months later and do a bit more. So it did take probably 10 years from the time that Greg told me to the time that I actually became convinced myself. 10 years. It probably did take that long, yeah. 
Wow. Well, at least you didn't rush in. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you took your time, and it sounds like this was a back burner type of issue. I don't know if you have that expression, just something that sort of yeah. simmers there on the, on the back of the stove while you're doing, focusing on other things. And uh, yes. when, his, when his book came out, did you, did you read it or did you, did you think, oh, this is just, this is, this is really bad? Um, what was your reaction to his book? I was the one who actually suggested to Greg or, or that he actually should write a book on it. Even though I wasn't convinced, I said, hey, look, you know, you know some of your, your ideas and some of these things need to, need to be out there for, for public consumption. So, um, you know, I, I was becoming more convinced uh, and of course, Greg's book was another step in that direction. Mm-hmm. I was also heading up the local ministers fraternal, um, which is a, a fellowship of, of local ministers. And I was, um, I guess, the president and heading that up. I remember in one of the meetings, this was fairly early in the piece, in the devotion that we would share in, in different ways, one of the, the Anglican minister made a statement. He said, oh, Jesus had to be God to die for our sins. And once I would have just accepted that, but I said, you know, where does that actually say that in the Bible? Mm. And then he he became concerned uh, that I was questioning, you know, as I was. So we got together for coffee and I started to tell him, you know, something of my different thinking around particularly who Jesus is. Unfortunately, there was... Uh, very much, you know, a confidentiality yeah. understanding within the minister's fraternal. But he went outside that and he he let the, I guess, the ministry coordinator of Churches of Christ in New South Wales know that I was, you know, unorthodox in my theology. What stage were you in at that point? Were you still questioning things or had you made up your mind when you encountered him on this? No, I was, as I said, it was uh, a bit earlier in the journey and yeah. I, I wasn't yet convinced, but I was certainly asking a lot of questions and rethinking. That's interesting because even when you weren't trying to evangelize him, he felt that you even just questioning this, even just pushing back on this question, well, Jesus yeah. had to be God to die for our sins. Where does it say that in the Bible? That that alone was was grounds for... Uh, maybe not a witch hunt, but uh, for breaking confidentiality and really outing you as somebody that is is questionable. Because I mean, everybody knows this is this is the shibboleth, right? This is the doctrine you mm. can't question. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, so, that's, right. Um, that's right. If we could just back up a second, what what would you say made you doubt the? Mo- I mean, o- other than the fact that your brother was doubting this doctrine, what what were your number one doubts? that got you thinking maybe this doctrine of the Trinity that I've learned isn't correct biblically. Yeah. Well, I think when I started to ask questions or discuss with my brother, initially it was just to try to argue him back to, uh, you know, the, the Orthodox faith, but I began to realize that it's not as clear cut as I thought, um, that there's actually another side to the story, another side to the argument and I think for, for many people, you know, like I was, I, I was brought up with Trinitarian teaching. I was taught it. I believed it. I, I preached it. But I, I was just totally unaware that there was another view. And as you start looking into it, you, you realise, hey, there's a, there's a whole lot more here that I've never been told about. And, you know, I don't know whether people just deliberately keep it silent or I think people just aren't aware. So that was the first, I guess, realisation. Hey, look, there's a whole lot more here that, that I haven't been familiar with or made aware of. And then um, I think the second big step for me was realising that, uh, you know, the Bible is from a Jewish cultural background. You don't really appreciate that. And, and good exegesis, good uh, hermeneutics, uh, just understanding what the Bible means in terms of what it actually meant to the people who wrote it and would have heard it, um, you you just really need to understand the Jewish cultural background because, you know, we don't appreciate that the Jews were so vehemently and strongly monotheistic. I mean, the, the Shema, the basic statement of their faith was that, you know, Yahweh is one person. So they were 
you know, just vehemently monotheistic. And also that their Messiah, as far as they understood, was going to be a human being, a man, a natural descendant from David. You need to bring that assumption into the New Testament, not some, you know, theological paradigm. So in other words, we need to assume that that's that's the the background that the, the New Testament writers were writing from, not assume that they were writing from a Trinitarian understanding. You can only get to that if they clearly teach or tell you that that's what they believed and somehow they they themselves had made that shift. But there's no indication in the New Testament that the writers were grappling with that or that they were arguing that. You know, it just doesn't appear anywhere in the New Testament. For them, God is one person and Jesus, you know, was a special but uh, very special but very much a man, you know, a, a special man. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is that as a hermeneutic, as an interpretation technique, we should align our presuppositions, when it comes to the New Testament at least, with what Jewish people's presuppositions and expectations were regarding the Messiah, rather Mm -hmm. than our traditional creedal formulations that we're looking to uphold what you just articulated there, that little shift at once must have put you in a risky situation <laughs> because as soon as you're willing to uh, to do that, it becomes possible for you to doubt the Trinity idea. Uh, at the same time, it is still possible for you to believe in the Trinity if approaching it from that perspective, we see the New Testament teaching clearly, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God and three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, co-essential, etc. Mm. What, what you did is you detached yourself from the traditional language in most denominational statements of faith or the orthodoxy, right? This mm. O word, yeah. orthodoxy is almost, or, orthodoxy is defined as believing in the Trinity, I mean, there are a few yes. other things in there too, but that's <laughs> certainly the, the, it seems like always the first one on the list, right? Uh, even yes. above the Bible, interestingly enough, uh, you know, may, maybe you doubt the Bible's authenticity a little bit, but just believe in the Trinity, at least. It seems <laughs> like uh, that happens a lot. So this move must have been just huge for you, reading it yes. with new eyes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know, it's interesting when you read the history uh, of the debates in the third and fourth century, uh, you get an appreciation of just how enamored the church leaders or theologians of the time were with Greek philosophical thinking. They just, uh, you know, love to interpret the scriptures allegorically rather than reading it in its historical and cultural context. It was almost an anti-Jewish feeling, which is expressed in some of the anathemas that they came out with at that time, like it was an anathema. It was to, for a, a Christian person to Judaize themselves by observing the Sabbath, for example. There was a very clear shift away from a Jewish understanding of the Scriptures to a Greek understanding. You know, so things like the Jewish concept of agency, the Hebrew understanding of, you know, pre-existence, not being necessarily physical but, but notional, uh, just the fluidity in, in some of the terminology with, with, you know, God and Lord, the wisdom personification tradition and how John uses that in his prologue. I mean, there are just so many things that we don't appreciate often when we read the Bible from a Jewish perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what many of us do, Jeff, is we pick up the Bible and we say, what is it saying to me today? And uh, <laughs> I, I think because God inspired it and God can work within us to apply it to our lives, uh, we can make some progress and, and get some insight that way. Uh, but I, I think if we're going to steer clear from anachronism, reading our own yeah. assumptions into the Bible, we should first ask the question, well, what did the Bible say to them who were the first audience? Do the hard f- historical work on that and then ask the question and what does it mean to me today in light of yeah. uh you know the intervening period of time but uh so that so that's great what what would you say as you continue to 
press in on this, what would you say were the decisive reasons that really uh, won you over to the other side? Because, I mean, this is not some small matter. It's not like, oh, well, I used to like uh, chocolate ice cream, but now I like strawberry ice cream. You know, this is yeah. that's a that's a change of mind that doesn't have very significant consequences. I mean, this change of mind that you went through had the potential to uproot and turn your whole life upside down, right? So you you mm-hmm. must have come across some really decisive reasons as you continued here. So Jeff, what other reasons were decisive in bringing you to this position? Well, Sean, I guess for me, the turning point was when I read the New Testament from a non-Trinitarian and a Jewish perspective. Look, all of a sudden, it just started making a whole lot more sense. It was just a lot clearer. It was a lot more consistent and compelling. I I didn't kind of have to do these um, mental gymnastics to backflip and try to make things fit. And, And look, also, I didn't have to contend with all those anomalies or inconsistencies or contradictions, whatever you want to call them, that are there within the Trinitarian paradigm. You know, things like, uh, how can you have a singular God who is also plural? How can you explain three persons who constitute one being? And how can Jesus be both like, you know, fully human and fully God? I mean, how does that work? How can Jesus be eternal and yet begotten? The Bible says God can't be tempted, but Jesus was tempted. In fact, in every way, just as we are, Hebrews says. I mean, we know God is immortal uh, and therefore cannot die, is unable to die, Paul says in, in Romans and Timothy. And yet Jesus died and was raised to life again by the Father. We read that no one has seen or can see God. No one has ever seen God, John says, yet Jesus was seen. And God knows everything, yet Jesus himself admitted there were things that the Father knew that he himself did not. And then there's that question of, you know, why why would all authority in heaven and on earth have to be given to Jesus? I mean, wouldn't they already be his by virtue of his being God? And if Jesus is God, how can he have a God over him? Which, I mean, Paul clearly states uh, a number of times, and particularly very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. That one in 1 Corinthians 15 is particularly powerful because it states that he will be, that Jesus will be in subjection to God for all of eternity. So the, the standard comeback yeah. to that is to say, well, that's just by virtue of his incarnation. He is subject. He's really co equal, but because of his incarnation, he's sort of playing the role of a of a human subject that then he was elevated beyond and back to his original equality with God. But yet 1 Corinthians 15, 28 very clearly says that this is a a permanent subordination, even in the eternal age, after he hands the kingdom over to his father. So, I mean, yeah, this is quite a a list of real difficulties here for for Bible-believing people that are also trying to understand and affirm the doctrine of the Trinity over against what seems to be a simpler biblical understanding of Jesus as Messiah, as human Messiah. What was the re- response in your mind as, as you were coming across these different reasons or, or qu- sort of unanswerable questions? How did, you, uh, how did you work through them? What was the next thought you had? You know, as you know, Sean, the classic response and the default position of Trinitarians is to see those anomalies uh, and call them a mystery. I mean, they say, you know, it, it's, it's a mystery. We just can't understand God. Uh, but the problem is that even though they're using the word mystery, they're using it in a very different way than it's used in the New Testament. And uh, I did a word study on, on the Greek word for mystery and found that in virtually every case, where mystery is used, it doesn't refer to some kind of, you know, unfathomable truth beyond our comprehension. Rather, it it refers to information that was previously hidden, but has now been revealed by God and is able to be clearly understood, explained and communicated to others. 
you know, you can't just default to mystery as a kind of like a convenient cop out to sidestep those contradictions that are of, you know, the paradigm's own making. You are certainly right about this, Jeff, um, that the standard response to asking difficult questions about God's nature is to say, well, you're a puny human being. How do you expect to understand the infinite mind of the Almighty God? And uh, I have to admit that that is a very, very sensible response, but that's not really what we're doing here. We're not trying to peer within God to understand his hidden inner workings. We're trying to understand what he's revealed about who he is, what he's revealed about who his son is, and the Holy Spirit. And so we're, we're not trying to, to move beyond Scripture. What you've been saying over and over is that that's really the Trinitarian view, is going beyond Scripture and pontificating about these natures and substances and other philosophical ideas. What you're trying to do is understand from what God has revealed about himself, who is he? Who is Jesus? What is he? What is Jesus? And so this whole appeal to mystery is not a sufficient answer to the questions that you raised, right? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point, Sean. And and look, I guess the other thing is that I carefully examined, you know, what every New Testament author has actually said about who Jesus was. And I realized that actually none of them were claiming that Jesus was God. I mean, I know there are certain statements that are are mistranslated or reinterpreted to try to make them say that. But those are relatively few, and those exceptions, I believe, can be easily explained. For example, I mean, you'll search in vain in the Synoptic Gospels and the Book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, to get any hint of any deified Jesus. And even though some statements in John's Gospel, you know, are used to back up a Trinitarian understanding, you know, he himself expressed that his intention was that to prove or to to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, not that he is God. And Paul always makes this very clear distinction. He says Jesus is the Son of God. He says he is of God. He says he is the image of God. You know, now my, my image, my image in a mirror or a picture is distinct from me. It may clearly portray and reflect what I'm like, but it's not me. So Paul uses these distinctions. And even when Paul uses, you know, our Lord or Jesus Christ, the Lord, it's not, as a lot of people assume, a way of identifying him as God, but rather it's a way of differentiating him from God. You know, in Ephesians 4, he talks about, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, in all and through all. He makes these clear distinctions. And that's not even to mention statements like 1 Timothy 2.5, you know, there is one God and one mediator between God and human beings, you know, Jesus Christ, who himself was human. I mean, it's a very clear statement. Mm -hmm. So I guess, Sean, I... I believe everything the Bible testifies about Jesus. I believe that he is the human descendant of David, that he was miraculously conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit, that he is the unique son of God. He's the Messiah. He's uh, the anointed one. He is empowered. In fact, John says in chapter 3, you know, that he had the spirit without limit, that he's authorized by God to be the saviour, of the world. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only one through whom we can know God and come to the Father. I mean, he's the Lamb of God who died for our sins, whom God raised and exalted to his right hand, gave him a name above every name, placed everything under his feet. He's King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's everything the Bible says about him, but he is still subject to the Father. In Luke 12, he says, you know, that a kingdom has been conferred on him. In Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. So, look, I just believe that, you know, to understand who Jesus is, 
you can understand him far more clearly, far more consistently within a Jewish understanding than with a subsequent Greek theological kind of construct that were expressed uh, that was expressed in the creeds. Yeah, yeah, I see that. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, I guess in conclusion, I just want to say, look, I just want to encourage everyone, everyone, let's just get back to what the Bible says and especially to what Jesus himself said, you know, very clearly, for example, in John 17, 3, that the Father is the only true God. And uh, when Peter declares him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says, you know, that's it. You know, that's who I am. And that's the bedrock I'll build my church on. So it's about getting back to the Bible. It's kind of getting back to who Jesus himself declared he was and his identity. Amen. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox here. Uh, I'm preaching no, I away. love it. I love it. I'm, I'm cheering you on. I think that's a, a great diagnostic question that any of us can ask is, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? And if your answer comes back, the second person of the Trinity who coexisted in eternity past in a in a in a Trinitarian dance of love or whatever how, however that is expressed uh, I'm sorry that just doesn't sound like Peter and it's not like Jesus mm-hmm. said well Peter you've got it half right or Peter you you're getting close to the truth no he says blessed are you Simon Barjona Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I mean, that is Jesus giving a gold star to his disciple student and saying, you got it right. And who are we to, to, you know, come back and be like, well, that's just 1% of the the total truth of Jesus' identity. I I think that that's hubris for us to do that, right? Yeah, well, I think the translators have a bit to answer for as well, because when you actually look at some of the way they translate some key passages, uh, if they do bring very much a biased uh, interpretation and translation into the text, which is unfortunate because a lot of people just read it as fa- at face value and, and uh, don't dig any deeper. When you, you begin to realise, you know, when you start looking into it, that the Trinitarian position is very fragile. It just really rests on you know, several texts and those texts, when you actually look into them, aren't nearly as clear cut uh, in terms of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it is very much a proof texting approach where, you know, you come to the Bible with a position and then you look around to find evidence to back up your position. And, And the evidence is very skewed and often needs to be taken out of context to make it fit, you know, what you wanted to say. Um, and I began to realise that that was, that was happening, you know, in, in, in some of those key passages. When you actually looked into them, um, it wasn't backing up a Trinitarian view necessarily at all. When that happened for you, did you feel duped? Like, oh, man, I can't believe I <laughs> bought this explanation. It's so flimsy now that I look at it carefully. But, uh, you know, it's something you probably believed your whole life, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how blind you can be when you've got a particular paradigm. You then get locked into a particular way of seeing things. You know, for example, the word God appears, what, 1,300 times or something in the New Testament, uh, and it always refers to, you know, the Father. There's a couple of, you know, disputed verses, um, but it's, you know, whenever... Paul, for example, talks about God. He's always, it's always the Father or, or Hothios, the God or the only God. It, he's always referring to the Father. Um, you know, as he says in, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, he says, you know, there is only, there's only one God. We know that there are many so-called gods or lords, and, of course, there was a fluidity of those terms in his day. But he says for us, for us Christians, there is but one God, the Father you know, who, from whom all things come, and there is but one Lord. And when you actually look at his, his, his uh, letters, apart from a couple of quotes from the Septuagint, he's always totally consistent in his, you know, God is always the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And if Jesus has a God, how can he be God? And you just start seeing things that you didn't see before when you were stuck in that particular paradigm. Yeah. Now, once you change your mind, how did that affect your role as the lead pastor there at Rivergum? So what happened was I um, was called to a meeting uh, with the... The, the, the moderator and another person from the conference executive, they said, look, we've heard rumours that maybe you are you know, fairly heretical in your views and we're concerned as to what this might mean. So we had a long meeting and I shared with them something of my journey. Um, but I was still on the journey and certainly... There was no preaching or of, of any of this information or anything, and it was just you know my own personal journey. So they accepted that, and then they heard other rumours. So then I had a second meeting with them and and explained further. And in the end, they were happy for me to continue um, in ministry in, in uh, churches of Christ. Uh, so and, and I I'd, I'd mentioned this journey with my elders so that they were aware and. In very general terms, with a couple of the staff, as, as we brought them on, I let them know that, you know, I don't necessarily have traditional views on the Trinity. So they knew it in general terms. But I guess the thing that was in my favour was that I was able to say, look, I'm just exploring this. I'm on a journey. You know, I haven't fully resolved it. And I think that probably, you know, calmed the waters a little bit. I see. However, the Minister's Fraternal did excommunicate me. Wow. And the Anglican minister said he would pray for my soul uh, <laughs> because he thought I was, you know, I had lost my faith. <laughs> but, yeah, they they met and they excommunicated me. And not only that, they blacklisted our church. And so there were rumours going around that we were a heretical church based on my personal, you know, sort of journey. Um, so yeah, that, that then caused some repercussions. Wow. So what happened next? I got to a point where I could no longer say, look, I'm just on a journey, um, that that was not, you know, necessarily the case that I'd actually come to a settled position, um, that I was no longer Trinitarian, that, you know, I, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of God, but not himself God. And, and uh, so I could no longer say I was on a journey. And a couple of the staff, when they sort of realised that I was more definite in my views, and even though I, I never preached it, I never brought it out, you know, it was just my own, I, I didn't bring it out into the church, into the public domain, but uh, in staff meetings, etc. I guess the discussion came up. And so they then raised the question with, once again, the Churches of Christ leaders and with the elders and that precipitated uh, a meeting where I more fully explained actually what I believed and that I had actually come to that place uh, as my settled position. How was that received? People weren't too sure what to do with all of that. Well, they wanted to know what, what's the Churches of Christ official position? You know, they said, look, you know, what is that? And I said, well, Churches of Christ don't have an official creed or they don't have a, a position. They simply have this, this sense of in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things love. So, right. you know, I said, I don't believe this is an essential for the faith and therefore people should be able to come to their own opinion about it. But then, of course, the debate was, is it essential or isn't it? Uh -huh. and, and that was the issue. <laughs> so what did they decide? Well, I wrote a paper, not to prove the doctrine of, you know, Unitarianism or anything, but just to say, look, whatever people believe about this, I think it's a non-essential, and these are my reasons why. And what uh, were your main points out of curiosity on, on why it's not essential? Well, basically because the Bible never says that it's essential. Jesus said, you know, that the church would be built on the truth that he is the, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that nowhere are we ever, you know, sort of told that we have to believe Jesus is God. Um, but also it's it's a, an inferred or a constructed doctrine. It's nowhere clearly 
taught in scripture, you know, so how can that be essential? Um, and also I quoted a number of Trinitarian authors that said the same thing, that, um, you know, this is not essential. Hmm. What, what happened next? They decided to, to get in Churches of Christ, I guess, heavies, <laughs> if I could say that, <laughs> to, 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 give, to give their opinion. The theology professor at the Churches of Christ College wrote a paper to refute mine, and then we had a meeting with our leaders, our local church leaders, and the principal of the college and the Churches of Christ moderator. And the interesting th- thing there, uh, Sean, was that the whole debate that night, it wasn't about whether the Trinity is scriptural or not, or even whether it was essential or not. It was that it was unorthodox. And uh, because I was unorthodox, it wasn't acceptable, which to me was, a, was an absolute denial of what Churches of Christ historically have been about. Yeah, the whole view of traditions and creeds uh, that the Churches of Christ really, you know, especially the founders, brought out was that these decisions of the past were divisive. And if you mm. study, yeah, and if you study the history of it, the Council of Nicaea was called to to really strong arm and excommunicate people who didn't agree that the Son was eternal. And then the second yeah. council in, in uh, Constantinople in 381 was to uh, to insist that there's only one white, one right way to think about the Holy Spirit, and if you don't recognize that the Holy Spirit should be worshipped, just like the Father and the Son, then you're out, mm. you know, and, and on and on. 431, the Council at Ephesus was all about the, the Egyptians strong-arming named Nestorius at, of Constantinople, the patriarch, who was himself mm. pretty conservative and completely agreed with the definition they came up in the next creed in 451. But uh, anyhow, in 431, he got outmaneuvered politically, and he was, he was kicked out, right? So these creeds are used over and over and over again to exclude other Christians, yeah. and to overly define doctrinal matters so that you have to be more and more exclusive. You have to have more and more jargon and professional philosophers to even describe, much less understand what's going on, right? So, yeah, I think there's there's really a, a sad legacy that the Churches of Christ w- were able to expose. And what you're saying, mm-hmm. at the highest levels, in your experience, the Churches of Christ really only cared about one question— is this orthodox or not? And if it's orthodox, we're supposed to believe in it. Yeah, well, the thing was, and, and the illustration that was given, I don't, I'm not sure how relevant it is in America, but in Australia on our surfing beaches, we have red and yellow flags that they put on the beach and you, you swim between those flags uh, because they're, you know, the lifesavers are there and it's, it's uh, supposed to be safer water. So the illustration that was given is that you're swimming outside the flags and therefore you are in danger. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so, so in other words, you, you, you're not within the confines of orthodoxy. But wow. to me, that was such a denial of what churches of Christ have always been on about. We've always never worried about orthodoxy or, you know, other people's opinions. It's always comes back to the scriptures are our authority. Right, right, right. And, yeah, um, yeah. And particularly in areas where, you know, it's it's non-essential. But as I said, the debate wasn't around that. And in fact, as a result of that, Sean, because our church was, was one of the larger, more successful churches within the, the New South Wales denomination. So um, it, there was a lot of visibility uh, that, that sort of was aroused by this. And so the Churches of Christ have just recently... Uh, put together a statement of faith which they wanted to vote in as mandatory. Uh, well, hold for, on. I thought there was no creed but the Bible. Uh, well, that's it, exactly. But they have now brought in what, you know, or well, they sought to br- bring it in, and it was strongly Trinitarian. I mean, it was so strongly Trinitarian that many people said to me, I think they're just doing this because of what happened to you. Wow. But it, it was, a you know, this incredible... Um, attempt to bring in, I guess, what was a mandatory statement of faith, you could say a creed, which was strongly Trinitarian. 
And in fact, that was the strongest aspect to, to the whole statement. But it got defeated, just barely didn't make it through. You know, there's now a whole push to, to want to bring it away from our historic roots. So it's very sad to me. I, I feel, you know, that very positive heritage that I grew up with is, is getting lost. Yeah, well, I mean, it, the fact that the discussion was about orthodoxy and unorthodoxy rather than Bible verses and interpretation of Scripture is their admission at the outset that the Trinity idea is not biblical, that the deity of Christ, as understood from a Trinitarian point of view, is not defensible. Because if it was easily defensible, it would all be chapter and verse. Exactly, exactly. Right? So it's, it's almost like yes. they know they can't fight you, f- fight fairly in a, in a biblical contest. So we're taking yes. it outside the Bible to the question of, well, what do other Christians think about us? Are we Orthodox yes. or unorthodox? Are we in the majority or in the minority, really, it's just another way of saying that, you know, so it becomes a popularity contest. Yeah, yeah, no, look, and even the response to my paper, um, it, it wasn't about the scriptures. It wasn't about, as you say, Bible and verse. It was, it was just a lot of quotes from the early church fathers that they'd cherry-picked, you know, out to, to support, you know, the Trinity. It wasn't, wasn't a biblical, you know, statement of, of defence at all. It was... Yeah, very unfortunate. As so I said, did, I'm, I'm very, very saddened. Yeah. So how did this all come to a head and what was the final result? So when we had that meeting with our church leaders, staff and elders, and the two representatives from Churches of Christ, and basically their position was that I was unorthodox and therefore, you know, unacceptable, in their eyes, uh, because of the reputational damage it could cause and things like that. Uh, when that became clear that that was their position, I decided to step down from from being the senior pastor. So, thought about it. The next morning, um, I, I said to my elders, "I'm going to be resigning." Wow. And why did you decide to resign rather than stay in there? I mean, you're the lead pastor, right? Can't you stay? Yeah, I mean, I, I could have stayed, but I, I knew that that would have caused a whole lot of, you know, sort of uh, difficulty and dissension within this church, which I just loved and, you know, for 19 years had poured my heart and soul into and I didn't want to be the reason to have a whole lot of dissension and, and you know, difficulty for, for a whole lot of people. So I, I thought the best thing is for me uh, to step away so that, hopefully won't happen. Interesting. So I'm just connecting a couple of dots here. On the one hand, you said one of the uh, catchphrases, or as you guys call it, catch cry, of uh, Mm -hmm. the Churches of Christ is in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, what what was it? Yeah, Uh, liberty. Liberty, and then in all things love, right? So you're, you're identifying the Trinity doctrine as something that is among non-essentials, so you would then extend liberty. So you don't believe that uh, the people in your congregation that believe in the Trinity are damned to hell or something like that, and you think they shouldn't believe that about you. So the the greater concern is divisiveness. Am I getting that right? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So that's that was uh, really what was driving you. You didn't want to see the church split, because if you stayed in there, there was enough opposition and mounting pressure that that a, a division was inevitable if you stayed. Mm, yes, absolutely. I see. So it was really what was going to be best for the church, and it's, you know, it's not about me. It's whatever's going to be best for the church, and, and I felt that that was best if I, yeah... Remove myself yeah. um, to take away, you know, what could have been a very contentious and difficult problem. What has happened since then? How long ago was that? It's uh, been over two years now. Uh-huh. And unfortunately, and I said to the elders, I said, when, you know, left, I said, look, you know, this is going to cause some degree of fallout. Um, that's inevitable. But how well it's handled by the leaders will depend on how severe that fallout is. It wasn't handled at all well. And so, you know, the church basically just unraveled. Uh, it literally just went from bad to worse. 
because it wasn't managed well, it, it, it just caused all sorts of fallout um, for all sorts of reasons. Well, if we could quantify it, what about, about how many people were attending the church in its heyday when it was at its largest? Yeah, so we had over over 300 people who were a part of the church. And about how many are there now? Yeah, well, Guy, I'm not sure, Sean. Um, with COVID, of course, it's uh, hard to know where all the churches are at, but I've heard there's maybe 50 or 60 left at Rivergum today and uh, the rest have you know, gone elsewhere. Look, I, I guess if the Churches of Christ leadership uh, had have backed me and supported my right to hold the position that I do and stay true to our historic values, it's hard to know, I guess, where the church would be today. I've had uh, a lot of people say to me they wish they, that you know, I, I hadn't resigned and that if the church had stayed true to those values, then uh, we probably would have lost a smaller number. The church would have been in a much healthier position today. And um, look, it's all you know a bit hypothetical, but at the end of the day, I'm comfortable with uh, what I feel God asked me to do. So what else can you say, really? Wow. That's just incredible. And, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what you were trying to avoid. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Yep. Man. Well, how do you feel looking back on it? Do you regret resigning, or do you are you convinced it was still the right thing to do and that your hands are clean in a sense? Yeah, no, look, I have no problem about my decision to resign. In fact, you know, very clearly as I was praying, praying it through, I, I sense very strongly that's what you know God was calling me to do. And interesting, I, I then opened the Bible at, for my devotions that morning and read a passage that was absolutely confirming that. And and I still think I think whichever way you know it would have gone, it was going to always be problematic. But I just think that unfortunately, it wasn't managed well. And yeah. I when I stepped away, you know, I, I I could see things that were were not going to go well, and unfortunately, they didn't go well. So yeah, you know, I'm just yeah, I just have to resolve myself to that. Yeah. So talk to me about where you're at now. Any plans for the future? Are you retired? Are you are you renting a new tent once COVID's gone for uh, a new round of church planting? Or what what what, what kind of ministry are you interested in or involved with these days? My ministry with uh, defense, so my chaplaincy with defense is continuing. I do that part time as a reservist, and at the moment. As long as I'm fulfilling certain requirements, uh, Churches of Christ are happy to continue my endorsement, so that's good. If that vote would have gone through differently, that wouldn't have been the case. But so I'm continuing in my chaplaincy with defence and also um, I'm ministering in a Church of Christ which is not associated. It's come from a Church of Christ, but it's, it's not affiliated with Churches of Christ. It's an independent Church of Christ that holds on to the original uh, values of Churches of Christ very strongly. And I guess they've, you know, sort of feel that the Churches of Christ have lost the vision. And uh, it's interesting because I said to them right up front, I didn't want it to be a problem. I said, look, you need to know if you want me to come and minister in this church that I'm unorthodox in terms of my views of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And uh, I explained that very clearly to the leadership and expecting a huge reaction. And they said, basically, well, so what? That's a non-essential. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what, what, so what? Barton Stone didn't believe in it either. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it just wasn't an issue for them, which, I, you know, which, which was uh, flabbergasting given, given what I'd been through. And is this also in Sydney or is it far away? Um, no, this is in Wollongong. It's uh, just south of Sydney on the coast. So, Okay. Yeah. Very good. Is there anything else you wanted to mention by way of closing here? Uh, well, I have I have now written a book. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. What's it called? So, um, so I haven't yet published it. I'm calling it Christ Before Creeds. <laughs> and it has a double meaning of, you know, who was Christ before the creeds, uh, you know, Nicaea, et cetera, but also Christ is more important than the creeds. Ah. Um, 
So yeah, that double meaning. Yeah, Christ that's that's clever. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but uh, yeah. I did want to say thank you so much for talking with me today. No, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much, Sean. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's it for this interview. If you would like to get in touch with Jeff Dibel, you can email him, dibeljeff at gmail.com, and that's spelled D-E-U-B-L-E, Doible, pronounced Dibel, if you're in Australia, I guess, dibeljeff at gmail.com. Also, Jeff Dibel has written a book, as he mentioned in the interview here, Christ Before Creeds. What a great name for a book, huh? And I have read a large portion of the pre-published manuscript. It is well worth your time, and it is especially helpful for those of your friends and family members and neighbors who are Trinitarian because of Jeff's tone being so gracious, so conciliatory, and yet so uncompromising in the truth that he is laying out. So once that book gets published, I'll be sure to include information for you on how to get your hands on it. I also have a link to an interview I did with his brother, Greg Dibel, in the show notes for this episode, and would love to hear your questions and comments at restitutio.org. Just come on to the site. It's like restitution with no N, dot O-R-G, Find episode 366, Who Was Christ Before the Creeds, and leave your comment on this episode. Speaking of which, we got a comment in recently uh, from someone named Alan on an article I wrote called The Trinity Before Nicaea. Now, this article is also a podcast. It's podcast 175, Did Christians Believe in the Trinity Before 325, the Council of Nicaea? And this is something we just talked about in this episode as... One of the tipping points for Pastor Dibel to shift from believing in the Trinity to saying, well, maybe this really isn't the original understanding of the Bible, and that is this whole issue of church history. The simple fact is, before Nicaea, it is impossible to find the doctrine of the Trinity clearly explained. You can find little hints and little bits and pieces here that only serve as evidence if you assume ahead of time that the Trinity was already there, and then you find the the slightest statement that seems to confirm that bias, and you claim victory. But if you actually read these authors, more than just a sentence, but their, their whole paragraph or chapter or even book on the subject, you will see that that is not where they're coming from. The idea just hadn't arrived on the scene yet really until the late 4th century, and even then, in the late 4th century, we don't have the Trinity that many of us learn about today. This whole idea of persons is still missing in the late 4th century. We have to wait till the Athanasian Creed to get that kind of articulation, which would be somewhere in probably the 6th century. So, anyhow, Alan writes in saying, "...for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints." Given that the above statement is true, why then is the doctrine of the Trinity so confusing? Why are those who question it viewed with such suspicion? Why does it take textual and mental gymnastics to make the Trinitarian point of view when a simple reading of such texts as John 14, 28, 20, 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 show that at very least the Son is subject to the Father? How then can he be co-equal as the doctrine of the Trinity teaches? We are not told in Scripture that if we believe in the Trinity, we shall be saved. Rather, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.9 in the King James Version. Now, isn't that much simpler? Uh, Well, thanks, Alan, for writing in. I certainly do agree with the thrust of your statement, especially subordinationism. Subordinationism is absolutely the silver bullet for Trinitarianism, in my opinion, because you really do have so many statements in Scripture and church history about the Father being greater than the Son. I mean, Jesus flat out says that in John 14, 28, my Father is greater than I, right? But but then the, the Trinitarian comeback is to say, well, that's just because of his incarnation. In his incarnated role as a human being, he sort of pretending like the Father is greater than he, but in reality, they're both fully and completely of the same essence and dignity and status and so on. 
However, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 does not leave room for this sort of incarnational gymnastic because there it says that Christ is actually going to hand over the kingdom to the Father, to God, so that God may be all in all, and that Christ himself is going to be in subjection to God for all eternity. Now, that certainly doesn't make sense on a Trinitarian scheme, that for a time, the second person humbled himself, condescending to become a lowly human for a period of 30 or whatever years until he could ascend back to his prior state of exaltation, retaking and reclaiming his place as God himself, as one of the three persons of God. Well, look, if that were the storyline then 1 Corinthians 15, 28 just needs to leave our Bibles. Or uh, some other statements in 1 Corinthians. There's, there's actually two other texts, likewise, that are speaking of Christ in his ascended, exalted state and saying that he is still in subordination to the Father. So subordinationism is really a huge topic and a really important topic. It is really woven into the whole idea of just that father-son relationship that would have just been obvious to ancient people, that your father is greater than you are. And besides which, if they were the same age, wouldn't they be brothers rather than father and son? But that's, that's getting into the whole issue of the eternal nature of God versus the begotten nature of of the Son, and I think there's a real big difference there as well. But uh, I don't want to stray too far from Alan's comment here. Alan's main point seems to be that God is not the author of confusion. The Trinity is confusing, therefore it is not of God. I, I don't know to what degree I can, I can affirm that statement. I, I'm a little hesitant because, as sometimes people point out, should we expect to really understand the inner workings of God and not be confused by them. I found the argument a little bit on the weak side. Surely none of us, whether Unitarian or Trinitarian, is able to fully describe God's power, God's knowledge, God's presence everywhere. These are lofty topics, and I have to be the first to admit, there's plenty of how God runs things. I mean, we've just done four podcasts on this, right? There's plenty about how God runs things that I don't understand. And I think it's it's good to peer into the matter. As Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. Those of you who are kings and queens in training for the royal age to come, uh, I think it is worth searching searching these things out and coming to a better understanding. But really, we are going to be limited by what God says about himself. And that is a whole idea of special revelation, of scripture, of inspired utterances of God through his prophets, through his apostles. And really the question is not, how can we wrap our minds around the inner workings of God? Rather, the question is, has God communicated in a sufficiently clear manner in scripture such that the Trinity is plain? And uh, I would strongly agree with Alan that he did not. Not only do we not find the T word in Scripture or phrases like God the Son, consubstantial, co-eternal, eternally begotten, and so on, but those concepts are not even there, not even close. What we have is a beautiful account of a, a young Jewish lady who gets visited by an angel, has a miraculous baby, and that boy grows up to be the Savior of the world. That's what we see in Scripture. Everyone thinks he's a human being. Everybody. The onus really is on those who are going to claim some other mysterious origin for the Son of God. And I'm glad to have those conversations. So thanks for writing in, Alan. If any of the rest of you would like to write in, come on to restitutio.org. That's it for today. I'll see you next week. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can do so at restitutio.org. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.